Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this session on ethics in practice. I'm delighted and very excited to open this final session of the Just AI Network's week-long series of events on prototyping AI ethics futures. Thank you very much for joining us. I should start by saying that we have um, live captioning available during this event. Uh, you can access it via Zoom's closed captions button, but we also provide a stream text version of the caption and the link to that is posted in the chat now. This event is also being recorded and the video will be available on the AWS Institute's website in the coming days or perhaps even today. Uh, also, feel free to engage in the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag AI Ethics Futures. And a final bit of housekeeping, um, you'll find the chat and Q&A buttons at the bottom of the Zoom window. And I would encourage you to Put your questions to the panelists into the Q&A box and we will come to them in the third part of the event. But also feel free to share uh, links or resources uh, in the chat as well. Now, after all the housekeeping out of the way, uh, my name is Imre Bart, and I am a researcher with the Just AI Network, which is supported by the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the Ada Lovelace Institute. And over the course of the last year, uh, I've been working with Professor Allison Powell, uh, the network's director, and Dr. Louise Hickman, our senior researcher, on prototyping a humanities-led approach to AI and data ethics. And the various strands of our activities were showcased and discussed during the course of this week. So if you haven't had a chance to attend any other events, I would uh, recommend that you check out the Ada Lovelace Institute's website because recordings are available and all of the events have been absolutely um, amazing and, and stellar. So this is the final one, and this is showcasing our thinking and our work around um, ethics in practice. It has been one of the strands that we have been pursuing, both in terms of thinking about our own work, conducting research in this space, and trying to support and create a network, but also with regard to AI and data ethics. And anyone who has been following this space is very much aware of the degree of prominence and visibility that ethics and the discussion of ethical issues around AI has attained over the last few years, really. We have seen the explosion, the proliferation of ethics guidelines and tools and frameworks developed by a variety of organizations, but uh, spearheaded by industry actors. We are also seeing uh, enormous investments, multi-million dollar investments into centers devoted to AI ethics. We have dedicated conferences, journals, and now even educational and training programs that certify people as ethical technologists. But there are complex open questions related to how AI ethics is to be understood uh, in different contexts. How is it understood in different contexts and by different actors? And especially how some notion of ethics is to be translated into practice. How do we move from abstract principles to operationalizable practices? Who should be concerning themselves with this translation? What are the roles of organizations like public and private funders, um, academic institutions, um, public and private uh, enterprise, uh, small companies and large companies? At the same time, we are seeing failures and, and shortcomings when it comes to ethics. For example, the ethics washing scandal related to the EU's guidelines, um, Google's dismantling of its ethics board, um, and the scandalous firing of Timothy Gebru, and this list could really go on and on and on for a long time. So besides the challenge of embedding ethics into processes of technology development, there is another level or, or type of questioning uh, that has already surfaced multiple times over the course of this week, and it really came out forcefully uh, during yesterday's session on uh, racial justice. And this question has to do with the fact that for many scholars and activists, the discussion about AI ethics itself is, is fundamentally flawed in, in many ways, and in a sense serves as a distraction that can even be actively harmful for certain communities. This is a criticism that suggests that um, AI ethics is in a way limited with regard to the kinds of questions that it can possibly ask, and that it has failed in many ways to address deeper underlying issues of power, inequality, and justice. And so this is broadly the space or the scope that we would like to explore together with an amazing group of, uh, of speakers today. We are first going to have a moderated discussion that is going to be facilitated and chaired by Andrew Strait, who is Associate Director of Partnerships at the Ada Lovelace Institute. 
and then we're going to open up the floor to have a Q&A for about 25 to 30 minutes. And then at the end, Professor Ellison Powell is going to round off and close the week and make a very exciting announcement. So if you can, I would, uh, I would ask that you stick around until the very end. Uh, and with that, I'm going to pass the word to Andrew. Thank you very much for joining and please enjoy the session. Thank you so much, Imre, and such an honor to be here with this esteemed guest today to talk about this really fantastic issue in ethics and practice. Um, um, my name is Andrew Strait. I'm the Associate Director of Research Partnerships at the Ada Lovelace Institute. For those of us who don't, those of you who don't know us, we're a, a London-based research and deliberative body with a mission to ensure that data and AI work for people and society. Um, before we dive into uh, our, our guests and giving sort of short, brief intros and provocations to their work and their thoughts on ethics and practice, first, I first want to introduce them uh, to all of you today. And, and again, very excited to have this excellent group with us to discuss these points. Uh, first, I want to introduce Libby Kinsey, who is the head of data science strategy and operations at Okado Technology, a division of the Okado Group, which designs most of Okado's in-house technology around website and apps, automated warehouses and robots, machine learning-based fraud detection, customer service systems, and many other applications of AI and ML. Prior to that, she was lead technologist for AI at Digital Catapult and the co-founder of Project Juno. Libby retrained in machine learning in 2014 after 12 years of working in technology, mostly in venture capital. We're also joined today by Dr. Mona Sloan, a senior research scientist at the NYU Center for Responsible AI and adjunct professor at NYU's Tandon School of Engineering. She's also a fellow with NYU's Institute for Public Knowledge and her work centers on a range of topics around AI and public education, auditing and assessment methods, public sector procurement of AI systems, and the operationalization of ethics, specifically in German AI startups. Dr. William Isaac is a senior research scientist on DeepMind's ethics and society team and a research affiliate at Oxford University Centers for Governance and AI. His research focuses on fairness and governance of AI systems. And prior to DeepMind, he serves as an open society fellow and research advisor for the Human Rights Data Analysis Group. Lastly, we have Dr. Shannon Valor, the Biley Gifford Chair in Ethics of Data and Artificial Intelligence and the Director of the Center for Technomoral Futures in the Edinburgh Fest uh, Futures Institute at the University of Edinburgh. She's also appointed as professor in, in the Department of Philosophy at Edinburgh University. Professor Valor's research explores how emerging technologies reshape human moral intellectual character and maps the ethical challenges and opportunities posed by new uses of data and artificial intelligence. Her work includes advising academia, government, and industry on the ethical design and use of AI. And she's a former visiting researcher and AI ethicist at Google. I wanna thank you all so much again for joining us today for this conversation. And we'll now turn to each speaker to make a brief five minute remarks, a set of remarks on their perspective of what the most important current issues, challenges, or open questions arise with putting AI ethics into practice. We'll first turn to Dr. Shannon Bauer. Thanks, Andrew. And uh, thanks for inviting me to, uh, to join you today for this conversation. I'm, I'm honored to be uh, uh, on such an incredible panel and uh, really excited to, uh, to dive in. So uh, I'm gonna outline uh, five or six uh, open challenges uh, for putting ethics into, into practice that, um, uh, that I don't think will be a surprise to anyone, um, but I'll try to express my, uh, my take on them and then maybe uh, we can return to these in, in the conversation. So I think uh, one obvious uh, challenge is, is, uh, was, was already outlined in the introductory remarks uh, by Imra, which come, comes down to um, translation problems and, and understandings of what we mean when we use certain terms. Uh, often this is about translating uh, across uh, normative ethical uh, vocabularies and technical vocabularies on the one hand. Uh, so it's of course a, a known problem that there is a gap between various computational definitions of fairness in the machine learning context uh, and political and moral concepts of fairness uh, in, in uh, moral philosophy, for example, in political philosophy. Um, and, and that's a very well-known challenge, but it's certainly not the only one. Uh, concepts such as safety uh, are often uh, um, understood by, uh, for example, engineering teams in far narrower terms uh, than they might be understood by uh, human-computer interaction uh, experts uh, or philosophers. Uh, concepts like explainable or interpretable uh, have similar gaps. But in the opening discussion, it was clear that even the concept of ethics itself uh, uh, straddles these gaps. Uh, and, uh, and it isn't just about, uh, uh, you know, particular disciplinary uh, perspectives. It's also about 
the evolution of what ethics is and how it's understood. Now that ethics no longer is something that people encounter purely in a philosophical context, uh, that they encounter it more commonly in uh, these uh, industry settings, uh, we have to grapple uh, with these gaps. Uh, and uh, the idea, for example, that ethics is uh, a depolitical notion or a depoliticized notion, one that doesn't ask questions about justice and the legitimate uses of power. Well, you can only get to that notion if you've already stripped the, the core concept of ethics of, of, for parts. Uh, because if you go back to Socrates yeah, and Plato and from other traditions, if you go back to sort of the classical Confucian tradition, uh, ethics is always discussed in the context of power and, and justice and, and what are the legitimate uses of power and, uh, and, and, and what are the grounds uh, for that. So, uh, so we need to recognize that the concept of ethics itself uh, has already been uh, the victim of a certain amount of kind of uh, stripping down uh, of, of what's essential to it. And we need to recover the, those ideas. Um, I'm gonna now move to a second uh, concern, which is I think uh, the challenge of making ethical practice iterative and making it something that exists throughout the life cycles of projects uh, and products. Uh, so we need to uh, get in the habit of closing the information loop by ensuring that ethical decisions are always monitored for their real world impact on downstream stakeholders and that the information is fed back into the technology uh, and, and used to inform and improve future ethical processes. So I think ethical practices that conclude when a product or service uh, is launched are bound to fail. And right now, uh, a lot of processes are set up that way, right, to review and approve something that then will not get looked at again in a serious way. Um, if you contrast that with something like health, right? We don't treat health as something that is a problem to be solved and then we stop paying attention to it. Um, and we can't treat ethics as a problem to be solved. It's much more like health. It's an ongoing condition uh, that has to be maintained and monitored. And so we need to make sure that our ethical processes and practices are aligned with that. We also have to learn to resolve ethical trade-offs and value conflicts in ways that don't reduce to motivated reasoning, where we exploit ambiguity or uncertainty or moral conflict in order to justify doing what is easiest or what is beneficial to us, um, or exploiting ambiguity and value tensions to justify uh, moral cynicism, saying, well, hey, there's no obvious one right answer here that's 100% sure to be the correct uh, uh, outcome, so let's, we can just do whatever we like, uh, right? So the idea is ethics is ambiguous. It does involve uncertainty. It does involve value tensions and trade-offs uh, that doesn't uh, in any way give us license uh, to, uh, uh, to act in ways that are unprincipled or unjustifiable. So how can ethical tensions and conflicts be managed in a way that's principled or justifiable by ethical reasons? Um, we also need to think about uh, ensuring that ethical practices can accommodate principled resistance and critique without breaking. The fiasco that was Google's treatment of their ethical AI team is instructive, but it's hardly the only example of this problem. So how do we reward rather than punish people who bring critical perspectives? How do we make sure that their critique and challenges are heard and actually incorporated into practice rather than merely tolerating them? and allowing them to sort of be vented in a way uh, that uh, leaves them uh, um, uh, without any practical force. Um, so how can we uh, merge critique and challenge into, uh, into practice, uh, into uh, uh, doing things together uh, that actually have good effects? The effect of critique should not purely be negative, not should, should not purely be destructive. It should be uh, in, in order to enable us to go forward and do things in a better way. Um, even if that does sometimes mean not doing the thing we thought we were going to do. Um, so, so figuring out how we're going to accommodate uh, principled resistance and critique is essential. We also have to figure out how to measure success when ethics is often seen as a preventative force, right? The idea that, well, if, if we do this well, the, the outcome is nothing bad happens. But how do you measure nothing bad happening? Um, or how do you measure the positive uh, um, uh, outcomes uh, that, uh, that ethics ought to be able to bring about, um, particularly when you're operating in metric-driven environments uh, where metrics are uh, usually things you can count. Um, and counting ethical successes uh, is, is, is maybe the wrong way uh, uh, to, uh, to understand what, what, our, what our aims are. And then finally, the last point is we need to move ethics from 
a search to find a morally permissible way to do what we've already decided we want to do with technology, to something that guides what we conceive as worth doing with technology in the first place, um, where ethics is shaping the kinds of futures that we're choosing to envision with technology. And I don't think we've gotten there yet, but I do think that that's the important next step. Thanks. Absolutely brilliant points, Shannon. I really appreciated that. I think some really good points in the discussion that will come up um, already around sort of how, how do you uh, operationalize some of these, these, these points and at which stage in the sort of design process would you consider intervening? But first, I, I'd like to turn to Libby Kinsey to give uh, a brief opening comments and uh, hand it to you, Libby. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you very much for inviting me to join this panel today. I come, I suppose, from the perspective of thinking about what does it mean to develop and deploy responsibly in a commercial context? So my work at the Digital Catapult on the Responsible AI Adoption Programme um, was thinking about how, what processes or tooling are there, what support services might we build to allow companies of all sizes to develop and deploy responsibly? Um, and I suppose, um, the first challenge that arises, and it speaks to one of Imre's opening points, was around um, are we limited in the types of questions that we can ask when we talk about AI ethics? Um, and it's very clear, or, or at least has been my experience, that often when we talk about responsible AI, um, it is self-contained or removed from um, the sort of higher order of ethical business models or organizational values. Um, and I think uh, good organizations will create responsible AI, but naturally that raises questions about culture and values of ways of working and change management, which are really hard to do and rather interdisciplinary. Um, the second question, uh, challenge um, is around translation. And I, I suppose I've just got a slightly different um, perspective to Shannon's here um, in that I'd just like to highlight how immature um, translational methodologies tooling are. Um, first, because a lot of tooling um, has been made available and maybe that's not obvious that the kind of circumstances in which you might use it or where it might be appropriate um, are a little bit contested or unknown. And allied to that um, is the huge press attention around um, AI ethics, which has been hugely successful and important to making ethics part of the conversation, um, but does sometimes lead to a nervousness amongst participants to be open and transparent about what they're trying and the experiments that they are doing to be responsible. Um, and I think that that's a really huge challenge because um, we, need, we need it to be okay to fail in order to learn how to do things well. Um, and finally, my final challenge I just want to highlight is, is this question of the uh, Again, the perspective. So I'd love it if we could move the conversation or at least make benefits as much a part of the conversation as risks. And one of the problems that I encountered in my last role was that um, you can make the case for investment in responsible practices um, on a risk-based point of view, reputational or compliance point of view, but finding evidence that there might actually be a competitive advantage or a return on investment is much harder. And at least in commercial contexts, um, that's a really important um, area to look into more. We, we were running the programme at Digital Catapult, has, Digital Catapult has been running that programme now for a few years. And we're just starting to get some case studies that we can talk about, but it's necessarily a rather uh, long process. Thank you so much. Libby. Really good points about that, the importance of, of uh, needing to be okay to fail in order to learn how to do things well. I think it's a very uh, crucial point, Kex, very well. So Shannon's comments about, about uh, how, how we could create that culture of, of uh, thinking about benefits and, and um, a more expansive consideration around ethics. Mona, I'd like to turn to you now to, to give uh, some brief introductory remarks. 
Thank you so much, Andrew, and thank you to Ada Lovelace for hosting this wonderful conversation. I'm very honored to be on this panel today. And I want to start off my provocation really by stating how pleased I am to see a focus on ethics in practice, not ethics in numbers, ethics in theory, or ethics in policy. As a sociologist with roots in cultural studies, material culture, economic sociology and science and technology studies. And as a former ballet dancer, I am really convinced that all things in the world are things that we do, not just things that are. And I think everything's a practice and ethics certainly is no exception. Now we have seen the ethics hype emerge and then be replaced by the backlash against uh, ethics washing. We've <laughs> seen that in the show Silicon Valley uh, through the wonderful notion of tethics. If you haven't seen that, I recommend that particular episode. We are also really in the midst of a mounting and much needed uh, push for tech regulation, particularly in terms of personal data on both sides of the Atlantic, but also on other in other places around the globe. For example, China has just released a new draft for a data protection regulation. So these conversations are happening everywhere. I guess that backdrop, um, I think it makes perfect sense to ask what can and must happen when we do ethics. And I want to um, offer three thoughts and please bear with me as they turned out to be rather social science-y, yeah, but I'm just going to push that uh, a little bit today. Um, first, I think when we talk about practices, we really should, very much in the spirit of what is called social practice theory developed by uh, Elizabeth Shaw, for example, among many others, um, we should develop a habit of asking where a practice comes from and how it is made up. Social practices, whether they are driving, exercising, cooking, or designing a technology, all are made up of meanings, materialities, and competencies. And all of these, A, have a history, and B, are continually emerging, very much in the spirit in which Shannon just spoke about ethics being emergent. The reason why cars look the way they do today is because they are a continuation of the design of horse carriages. The reason why some AI technologies used in the hiring funnel, for example, those that analyze micro expressions and speech to predict personality, skill, and job fit, are deeply discriminatory, for example, against people with disabilities, is because they are at their core based on eugenicist belief systems. Ethics in practice means to take practice seriously and develop knowledge for these socio-historical continuations to make ethical decisions, whether in policy and technology design in the classroom or for yourself. Second, I think to develop these kinds of literacies, universities in particular, and I'm speaking as a scholar here, somebody who is in that system, universities must take a more active role, and Shannon and Libby both just spoke about the significance of translation. Computer science pedagogy, I think we can all agree, must change, but academics must come out from behind their decks, uh, desks in the ivory tower and engage in public discourse and community work and the building up of support structures for democratic engagement in technology design and policy. We need more and better incentives and rewards for academics who themselves can be very precarious to contribute their knowledge and expertise and their access to resources and networks to the quest of building technologies that are in the public interest. For example, by helping local government agencies making better decisions about how to procure public use technology, which I'm happy to talk uh, more about later. I think that is just as important or should be as important as writing the next award-winning essay. And third, uh, I think it is key to take seriously the practice of tech work in its broadest sense. It is no coincidence coincidence that we are seeing a push towards unionizing in the US, um, uh, in the US parts of the global tech industry, which is often part or partially motivated by a desire to leverage collective labor power in order to make more ethical decisions about client selection or the handling of misconduct, harassment, and discrimination in the organization. I'm currently running a research project on the operationalization of ethics in German AI startups. And even though we're very early in the data collection process, we can already see a few trends. There is a very strong indicator that worker participation 
particularly with regards to client selection, is a very important AI ethics practice. Relatedly, the practice of refusal is key. The refusal of working for the military industrial complex, for example, or the refusal to keep working for a company that had their track record of systematically discriminating against people of color exposed, which brings us really to the heart of techno-feminism and, for example, Sarah Ahmed's work on refusal, resignation, and complaint, as well as the well-known concepts of intersectionality. And I'm going to stop right here because I could have gone uh, on with that. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about any of these. And I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mona. Loads to unpack there in, in the Q&A and the discussion that follows. I really like that point that you raised around the importance of bringing historical knowledge to these considerations and discussions. That's such a, a really essential point to consider when we talk about the, the interdisciplinary nature of the ethics work that we're, we're asking firms and companies to take on. Lastly, I want to hand to William Isaac from DeepMind to give us his thoughts on this provocation. There's already been so many wonderful things said. I'm going to see if I can try to uh, raise a few meta points. Um, I'm taking a step back. I, I, I noticed, I think there was a kind of, in the preamble, there was a, a kind of framing about kind of high level ethics principles that have kind of emerged uh, of late and kind of, uh, you know, bottom-up efforts to try to provide some um, ways towards those goals, whether they're in the form of model cards, data sheets, and, and other practices designed to kind of like lean towards the goal of greater accountability and transparency. And I think one of the things that, you know, I guess the, to the question of, of where we're struggling is I think there's a kind of framing, what I call the kind of missing middle. Um, both these kind of tools that have emerged and these principles that have kind of been ascribed as the kind of goals we aspire to, um, there's something in between that, that I think has been overlooked. And um, I tend to try to define them as kind of socio-technical challenges. And I want to kind of highlight surface three of them and to provide a, maybe a sense of kind of like a meta clustering of like some of the things I think the other panelists have said. Um, I think the first one is that um, there's definitely a shift towards thinking about a multi-system world. Um, I think you know, I think someone mentioned the case of hiring. We see this in, in for many marginalized communities, their day-to-day -day experiences um, navigating through social welfare systems, et cetera, that you're not usually dealing with questions of a single algorithm, but usually multiple systems at play, determining the kind of fate and condition of many communities. And so when we talk about aspiring to fairness or even more ambitiously justice, you're not usually gonna be trying to define this in the terms of constraining one system, but usually a, a cluster of systems as well as human decision-making. So we have to think, we have to shift our thinking about trying to ascribe uh, ethical principles to a single uh, kind of like technological artifact, but think much more broadly about the system and the processes that generate the ultimate outcome. Um, and that obviously raises questions related to power, inequality. And, and, so, and, and so I think that kind of shifts your thinking about what the goals are and how you achieve them. I think the second point, and it's closely a related point, is thinking of the world as being multi-stakeholder. Um, very much, if you look at a lot of the kind of um, AI ethics doctrine, they're usually kind of uh, created and, 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 and devised by um, usually kind of powerful actors, um, corporations, governments, right? And very rarely do civil society and other actors have an equal footing in kind of setting these guidelines. Um, but I think the world is going to have to move towards a world where you have a much more multi-group approach to developing and, and designing what's, what attributes you want a technical artifact to possess. And this is obviously going to make large actors uncomfortable because the idea of having to open up your decision processes to other stakeholders is often a very delicate and difficult process. But it's an important one. And it's important because in many instances, um, in order to build trust and confidence in the technologies of the future, you have to incorporate multiple stakeholders in designing and building that future. And, and while I think there are many of these tools are very nascent in how you do it, I think the motivation and the demand is there. And I think it also relates to this position of critique. It's actually fundamental to have critique as part of a multi-stakeholder process, for, because for many instances, the communities that are going to be newly involved in this process have never had a seat at the table before. And so as a result, there's going to have to be space for disagreement and also adjudication of this disagreement in order to make progress. But inevitably, the yields that are gained from this are going to be are going to kind of be positive some because in many cases, technology we can trust will ultimately have the biggest societal impact um, rather than ones that are kind of built in, 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 in quiet and in, in, in close quarters. And lastly, I wanted to kind of mention this point of a multipolar world. And I think some people have mentioned this is that um, 
there, there was a great study in nature that was done about the kind of like uh, geographic distribution of AI ethics principles. And they were largely disproportionately um, kind of created in Western Europe and in North America and in China. And that also suggests that there's an idea that um, there are some communities, some geographies that are that are in the role of being able to define what the technologies of the future look like, what value systems we ascribe. I think we have to recognize and acknowledge that for technologies that are going to have, that do have a global impact, that we need to have more than one value system at play in ascribing what values are important in these technologies. And so I think the era that we will be moving into next um, is going to be a one where all communities want to have a say in what values we, we want technologies to, to adhere to and ultimately how they're delivered and manifested. And so I, I think this shift is really important and really profound. And it's one that I, I've thought a lot about in the work that we've done on decolonial AI and, and trying to envision what this kind of world where that is not led exclusively by the same powers and governments and institutions that have led in the past. Thank you so much for them. Those are fantastic points. I, I, I think it's a very good sort of summary of, and, and clustering of the different points you've seen come up by, 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 across this panel so far. I want to start us off by um, picking up a, a point that kind of was a little bit of a golden thread that kind of ran through each of these these um, brief brief uh, introductions around um, how do you how do we incentivize the kind of ethical thinking and, and uh, practical work that each of you have described. I think we've, we've seen in many domains that there's a, a risk of different in individuals within an institution having very different ideas of what ethics means or its limits and, and its scope. Um, we've seen cases in which, uh, in the case of Timothy Jimbaru, uh, of, of, of someone who's asking particular hard questions, ultimately um, being resignated for it. And I, I suppose that if we are gonna have this much more holistic and deep um, uh, form of ethics and practice. I am curious, how do we set those incentives in place to reward that kind of work and incentivize and encourage that kind of work, not just with large firms, but even smaller firms that are just in those early stages of a development process? I'm, I'm going to turn first to, to Libby uh, to ask this question, and then I'll go across the panel to, to others for their thoughts. It's a great question. Um, so, so the first thing I'd say is, um, in my work at Digital Catapult, particularly working with startups, one of the things that we offered was support from um, an external ethics committee to help them think about um, the ethical ele elements of their business. And um, no incentive was needed. Maybe there's a selection bias, but actually that offering became um, uh, a big motivation for startups to apply to the programme. Having said that, um, I did see some recent research from Consequential and um, I think it was the ODI in which they described organisations in which ethics is a bit like the office dishwasher. Uh, and so although it's everybody's responsibility, it's actually the person that cares the most that ends up doing the work of emptying the dishwasher. And that's, that's unsustainable and it's not scalable. So I think that comes back to um, culture. Uh, developing and deploying responsibly has to be um, not just an AI ethics question or not just something that the people that develop and deploy machine learning and data do, but it has to come top down. Um, and one of the things that I really like about my new role at Ocado Technology is that it combines responsibility for <clears throat> AI ethics, for want of a better term, but also um, best practices and machine learning operations. So I think that that confluence where one can embed best practices across the machine and the learning lifecycle, make sure that those best practices are part of the definition of done, as are kite marks relating to, say, security. That ensures that people are rewarded for, for good practices. Uh, it becomes part of their everyday work, their promotion, their pay review, kudos. Yeah, really good points. I mean, the notion of, of, of uh, kite marks and kind of other forms of incentives around uh, performance, I think is really key. Mona, did you want to come in on this point around incentives and, and, and incentive structures? Yeah, I think I can speak to that from kind of two perspectives. One, as an educator um, and an academic and kind of... Uh, trying to do that work in the academy and in, 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 in an engineering school, which I think can uh, stand for doing, you know, 
that kind of work in, 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 in a corporation, for example. Uh, and it, it kind of links back to the point of translation that Shannon and Libby made. That translation work is really hard. It's interdisciplinary. And although everybody always says interdisciplinarity is extremely important, and these multis that uh, William uh, Isaac just spoke about what are so important, but that's not necessarily um, rewarded within the academy. Um, when you do interdisciplinary work and you go between, you know, you jump between conferences, you jump between topics and you do that kind of translation work, that's not what the academy is necessarily interested in. And uh, likewise, in a corporate uh, organization, that's not necessarily what a corporate organization is interested in. It's a very kind of siloed way of building careers. So I think we need to find very on structures to address that. And I can tell you from teaching wonderful young engineers, they are so ready for that. The next generation of engineers really wants to do that work. They're kind of waiting for us to uh, get organized and, and make it happen. I'm going to run a, a big fair on public interest technology careers in the fall, and there's such big interest from students who are just so willing to embark on that. Um, and then I think the other perspective is just startups and German startups, particularly that I am currently researching. And what I see there is um, that it's very much seen as a kind of and Libby spoke about this, a culture problem, a leadership problem, ethics as something that you carry with yourself that is an acted in a daily practice. And so therefore, um, you know, looking at what that means on an organizational level is just as important as thinking about what that means on a macro level in terms of regulation uh, and in terms of compliance um, and so on. And the last point that I kind of want to make is, I think it's very important to agree, uh, to, to share and agree upon um, best practices, but it might be even more important to share failures. We're, we're not really willing to um, carry those with us and make those just as apparent and say, look, this is what we tried to do, and this is where it went wrong. This is where, where we ran into obstacles and learning from that. We are always very, you know, very much in favor of putting successful projects on the pedestal, but those are not necessarily ones we learn from. So I would actually advocate for a culture of sharing failures. And, uh, stop here. No, it's a really good point. So it ties very neatly with Libby's comments about the, the, the importance of, of encouraging people to, to fail and to share their failures. That's, that's a, I think, a crucial, crucial concept we pulled out. And I really like the, the points you've raised about the out the sort of incentive structures in academia. Um, we were in a, a, actually a call just yesterday um, talking about that exact, to exact topic and how interdisciplinary isn't rewarded, incentivized in the publications uh, space around what journals will accept. Um, which raises really difficult challenges for how you how you reward and encourage that more interdisciplinary role. Um, the startup space, I think, is, is a really interesting one, as well as the big tech space. I'm wondering if there's sort of different incentive structures that we might consider tweaking or adjusting. And Shannon, I know that you've you've done some work um, sort of across these areas. I would be curious on your, your thoughts on, on this incentives question. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I've, I've thought about this problem a lot, and uh, there's no there's no silver bullet. Uh, there's no uh, simple solution for it. Um, but I think a, a couple of things can be said. First of all, it's really important to look at um, the incentives that you have um, at every level of the organization. Um, and given that you're not going to throw out uh, your existing incentive structure, uh, very likely, right, you need to work the uh, ethical performance into it. And uh, so, for example, if you have a performance uh, review cycle, um, what are the questions on the performance review that are going to trigger identification of contributions in this area, right? If you're required to report uh, what you've achieved over, you know, the quarter or the year, um, there has to be a way where, uh, and I want to pick up on something uh, Mona said, you're able to report um, uh, the both the successes uh, uh, that you've had in uh, ethical uh, uh, product design or development, uh, but also the, the things that you've learned uh, and uh, and the ways that you've managed various conflicts or, or problems uh, that have emerged. And so there have to be really specific questions in that kind of performance review process that are targeting exactly what it is that you want to reward. Um, th this is really simple stuff, but it just often doesn't happen, right? You, you tell people you want them to be ethical and you leave their incentives exactly the same. Um, the other thing is that um, it, it also has to be looked at from a, a, a top-down uh, uh, a direction. So uh, in my experience, the thing that holds people back most often is the fear of what their immediate line manager is going to say 
if they flag a problem, if they say we have an ethical issue here we have to look at, or if they say, you know, the, what we're proposing to do about this ethical issue, I don't think it's going to work. I don't think it's adequate. I don't think this, this response will really uh, meet the need. And so we need to be able to figure out how can we uh, evaluate also managers and uh, executives so that their performance and the things they care about, like their bonuses, are tied to the performance of their teams in this area. Uh, and so uh, that's a pretty straightforward thing to do. But as we saw with the uh, uh, case of, of uh, pressure having to be put on Google to tie uh, performance in diversity and inclusion uh, to uh, leadership uh, bonuses and things like that, if you don't join those two things together, you're not going to get any substantial change. And all you're going to get is burnout from people who throw themselves uh, uh, at, uh, at uh, the effort of doing the right thing, then get punished for it or see other people promoted ahead of them for ignoring this. Uh, and then they just become cynical, burned out. They may leave the profession, they may leave the company, uh, or they may just become embittered. And now you have some, a scenario that's worse than what you started. Uh, so the important thing is to figure out how you avoid that worst case scenario. It's a really, really good point. William, I'd like to turn to you about this one because obviously someone who's doing this work inside of a research firm, I'd be curious for your perspective on that uh, incentives question, both from the sort of top level down, but also um, in, you know, as someone who's, who's doing it, how, how you would feel motivated and incentivized to, to continue your work. Yeah, I guess I was thinking of it um, from two dimensions. I think one is, um, I think in general, I think this is this matters for large organizations and for startups, but I think it's the kind of perceived external importance of these issues. Um, obviously, I think, you know, I think was mentioned in one of, by the other one of the other panelists. Um, I think there has been a sea change in kind of public demand for greater accountability and, and greater acknowledgement of, of kind of ethical processes and their decision making related to the release of the technology, um, how you know, how you know mitigating harms associated with it. And so I think obviously that creates an incentive structure in and of itself, um, that they know that there's going to be kind of a, a public um, kind of consequence for not taking these actions seriously. Um, but I think internally, I think, you know, uh, there's obviously the question of kind of valuing that work and valuing the work of critique. And, and, and I would say, you know, to kind of use a kind of, uh, you know, a STS term, reflexivity. Right. I think I think great organizations, strong organizations, right, have the capacity to be able to not only um, tolerate critique, but actively seek it out. Right. Because that is ultimately the way you get better technologies, more robust technologies. And I think, you know, doing that in that environment, you then do have individuals and teams like who are empowered to be able to do the kind of necessary work of manifesting these issues and actually driving consensus to ultimately have the impact that people ultimately want to see externally. Really good points. Yeah, I, I think that that notion of external pressure is a really good one to flag. Um, I, I did want to turn to a, a related topic, which is, I think, thinking about where one starts, uh, particularly as a startup in this space. Um, uh, I think one of the things that we've we've heard about um, in conversations with with many firms or many uh, um, founders or or startup firms who are thinking about these issues is where do we even begin? You know, like how how do I begin to think about these massive challenging issues? And I, I, I guess I'd just like to pose the question to the, to the panel about if you were to be advising a uh, a VC or a startup about um, where they should start to think about these issues, what they could sort of begin with, where would you suggest they, they start? Um, uh, Mona, I'll turn to you for this one for, uh, to, to offer your perspective. That's a tough one. Um, okay, I'm gonna try. So I think baseline, and this is, first point is boring. Baseline is compliance. You have to make sure that you are fully aware of and compliant with the uh, existing regulatory frameworks as they pertain to the, the product and the practice of your business uh, and that you're fully, uh, that everybody who is part of that young team is aware of that. The second um, thing is that you, especially with, um, with AI products, that you are, again, very aware of what you are trying to do with your product. What, you know, what, what's the claim that's being made in that product? Are you claiming that your product can predict personality? Are you claiming that your product can actually, through computer vision technology, for example, improve uh, the efficiency of manufacturing processes? 
um, what what's what is it about? What's the claim and how do you translate that in the product? Like what are the mechanics of that? And then make the connection to the third point, which is what are kind of the value systems that are you know, in place on, on a societal level, and these also are different, right? Conversations about ethics in Germany are different from conversations about ethics in the US, I can tell you that. Um, and also the individual kind of, or sort of, not individual, but individual and organizational value systems and, and ethics that are in place and that are practiced through everyday interaction in the workplace. Um, I think making the connection between the three of those would be what I would recommend to uh, startups. And the interesting thing is that startups often are doing that because they're, they're so small and everybody has to do everything. And then, you know, the scaling, everybody, a lot of the people we talk to talk about scaling actually as both an opportunity and as a huge threat to the integrity of, of their work. And so dealing with scaling, I think, is what can, can threaten them, making the connection between these points. Really good points. It, it touches on, I think, a concept that others have brought up around this notion of ethical debt. This, this, uh, the earlier that you uh, sort of bake in some practices or values or, or, or perhaps even without even realizing it, um, incorporate them, and it gets much harder to, to see them uh, down, down line, to contest them down the line, they're more opaque. And I think this point of articulating values, disclosure and, and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, compliance thing is a very good way to frame that. Um, Libby, as somebody who's worked with startups, I'd be curious about how that matches your perspective and if you had any other advice or guidance for um, startups. I, I hate to run a mini machine intelligence garage session right now, but I'd just be curious for your thoughts there. Well, I, I mean, I would echo much of what Mona said. Um, I think it is a huge advantage for a startup to be able to think about these questions right at the beginning. They have a clean sheet of paper. They're not constrained by legacy processes and tooling. They don't have the organizational complexity and consequent issues of who's responsible um, that maybe larger organizations have. Um, and they can set the culture, which seems to me to be so important, which at least is one of the main things that I've learned from, from working in this area. Right from the start, culture must be one of the very, very hardest things to change um, at a later date. And then flippantly, I would say a great place to start is the Machine Intelligence Garages Ethical Framework, because it attempts to take abstract principles and translate them into questions that have salience for um, machine learning companies and perhaps sorts of vocabulary um, that they use. Fantastic. Yeah, re really good points. I, I did want to pick up um, a, a sort of similar question about um, larger tech firms uh, and specifically this, this notion that came a bit more around sort of engaging and, and welcoming critique and, and feedback. Now, I think that's a, it gets again to this question of, um, uh, I think, a culture question. And I suppose one, one question I have for you, Shannon, is just if you were to be advising a large tech firm of how to incorporate or instill that kind of value within their existing operations, what would you suggest? I mean, are there, are there sort of practical ways you can encourage that kind of um, um, welcome critique or ways that you would see that being fit into specific parts of the product life cycle? Yeah, absolutely. Um... I mean, some of the things that have already been said are, um, are, are quite helpful and, and can apply to organizations at, of, of any size and scale. Um, but I think one of the uh, really important things is, and, and it's kind of the reverse actually of what needs to happen um, in startups. So let me start with startups and then sort of talk about the larger organizations. So I think often what happens with startups is um, you begin uh, with uh, kind of leadership personalities often that are um, in some ways indistinguishable from the product. Uh, or the service. Um, and then often, even if you do have, for example, um, a, a real passion for this product or service to be beneficial and safe and responsible, um, the ethical accountability can get lost very quickly in small organizations as they scale up. Because if, if it's invested in the idea of a person, and this is a, a danger I see all the time where people think of ethics as being about being a good person, and then people just reduce it to having good intentions, and good intentions are about 5% of ethics in practice. So they don't get you very far. And so if you have this uh, kind of personality driven ethics in a small organization, that can evaporate very quickly as the organization scales. So the most important thing for a small organization is to make sure that the ethical accountability is being made explicit 
Where does this responsibility live? How is it distributed across the organization? And then at each stage as the organization grows, making sure that structure's integrity is not lost. With a big institution, you often have the opposite problem, um, is that the ethics lives in these, um, these sort of structural networks, the teams, if you will, the ethical AI team or teams, if you've, if you've got one, and most big tech companies do now, um, but it often seems to uh, have a ceiling in the organization where the ethical culture doesn't penetrate above that ceiling. Uh, and so where you don't really get um, from, from the uh, um, kind of rank and file uh, and mid-level teams, you don't get a sense that senior leadership cares um, uh, or that they're paying attention. To this kind of work or that they're valuing this kind of work. So often, I, I think in big organizations, it, it needs to be reintroduced to senior leadership culture, uh, and they need to be doing a lot of heavy lifting of uh, carrying forward uh, uh, the, uh, the accountability and making sure that throughout the company, it's known that senior leadership values this and cares about it, and, and not just words, but shown in actions like the integration of this with bonuses and performance reviews, as I said earlier. Um, so I, I think uh, a lot of this is about making sure that it's explicit where the ethical accountability and support lives and, and not uh, allowing it to be uh, uh, something that uh, exists in one part of the organization, uh, but is invisible elsewhere. Really good points. It touches on that notion of data, of sort of ethics owners that I think um, Dana Boyd at Manny Moss and, and uh, um, Jacob Metcalf have talked about in their paper on that notion of, of yeah, discouraging that notion that there's an, an ethicist. So the ethics questions are, are their, their um, remit alone. Um, I, I think this is a really, a really good point though around, uh, around sort of how do you identify and more clearly uh, clear up where um, ethical accountability lies within a firm. And it touches on a, on a related topic about trade-offs and tensions. Invariably, there might be uh, major differences that arise between uh, an employee's perspective of what a company should be doing and what leadership might consider. And those, I think, probably get magnified the larger organization gets and the more diverse its, its, its workforce arises. I'm, I'm curious if, uh, William, you, you might uh, have some ideas about how we could think about navigating those kinds of um, uh, trade-offs or tensions that are Arise within a company or within a firm, and and what are steps that practically can arise that can help mitigate or um, lead to perhaps more positive outcomes? What we've seen so far. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I would say I think having good processes actually is like the way to kind of like manage some of the the kind of like gap between perhaps maybe you know in-house experts who are thinking about you know kind of ethical questions or the ramifications of you know like you know decisions on product or you know and broader society versus maybe like you know senior leaders who are trying to balance a wide range of issues simultaneously ethics and the kind of broader social impact being one of them um and i think gives in many because i think you know I, basically i think shannon's answer was like spot on and i could like i could just kind of copy and paste many chunks of it, but like I think particularly this kind of gap between like senior leadership and like what their vision is and like kind of the experts right like in just a vacuum you would just like you know it can, can be ignored it can be siloed and of course I think maybe another version is more outsourcing right that like these kind of systems can kind of exist in independent, like an independent function from the rest of the operations, right? But actually then doesn't actually really get factored in. And obviously that leads to a sense of, you know, is his work being really valued, right? But I think like, I think in a, you know, in a more positive use case, you would have some mechanisms of adjudication where at some point around the kind of life cycle of a product or, you know, or, a, you know, a piece of artifact, right? Like you get some sort of meeting of all these stakeholders where a decision is made and all this evidence is kind of like presented and discussed, right? And in that way, right, like I think, you know, I think to Shannon's point, it's like you do get this kind of elevation, right, of saying, okay, like we're making this decision, senior leadership then needs to be able to go and like communicate to the rest of the company, hey, we're doing this because of XYZ reasons, right? This is in alignment with our ethical principles and, you know, et cetera, right? And so I think like having those things are, are fundamentally critical to kind of being able as an individual kind of or a team working in a space to make sure that, you know, this is not just kind of like a kind of window dressing, right? You're doing this merely to serve the function of kind of like having ethical analysis. And the fact that ethical analysis is part of the life cycle and gets factored in. 
Yeah, really good points, William. I, I think that touches on, I think, a, a related topic about sort of where um, does power lie within large tech firms? Is it, you know, if, if um, you are aware as an employee of what your employer's values or, or ethical decisions are, then perhaps you might have more weight to say, I might just leave this company if, if, I, if I disagree with it. Um, that might also carry, I think, some significant more value or, or, or importance for a, a senior leadership to consider when making those kinds of ethical decisions if they are aware that employees will be aware of them as well. Um, I did want to come back to one point that Shannon um, raised in her introduction, which was this question about um, how do we measure success when ethics is seen as a preventative force? I, I think that's a really important question to consider and a really hard one to answer. Um, again, we often think of ethics as like, a, and at least in practice, it tends to be mitigating harm and avoidance, but um, how do you sort of measure that kind of impact? when it's uh, hard to measure things that don't happen. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go first to, to Libby and then Shannon, we'll come back to the very end because I know this is a point you've thought significantly about. I, I think I might have to be quite narrow in my interpretation of that question. <laughs> but well, two things. One is um, anecdotally at least, and certainly in um, personally, um, data scientists and machine learning people are voting with their feet and choosing to join organizations which are aligned with their values, as you were talking about, rather than those in which perhaps um, they're not aligned or it's very unclear what the values are. And my go-to anecdote here is a NeurIPS um, workshop maybe five years ago on responsible AI in which a very brave and unnamed Facebook employee stood up and said, I'm responsible for AI ethics at Facebook, or at least I'm part of one of the teams, and I don't know what our organisational values are. So I suppose that's that's one area in which you could measure employee um, attraction and retention as as one measure of success. And the the other um, is maybe a little bit um, hopeful on my part, but I I think that customers do take into account values and transparency about how you do your machine learning and data science when they make buying decisions. Um, and these can be formalized in supplier code of conduct um, and things like that. But um, maybe a proxy measure for that is, is the question of trustworthiness, which can be ascertained with various um, ways that I don't know anything about because I'm not a social scientist. <laughs> Well, I'll turn to our social scientist uh, next <laughs> and to help answer. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious, Mona, if you have any thoughts about this and this notion of how we measure ethical success. Um, again, I find that very difficult to answer because that the question for metrics is, you know, with hard to square with kind of things like the lift experience, value, qualitative data, and all of that. I think there is just a, um, you know, just a, a tr again a translation gap that we need to, a structural translation gap that we need to address before we can start thinking about that however i think there are as my co-panelists have all said um, mechanisms and tools for uh, accountability such as transparency for example um i've spoken to a startup who have a very elaborate method for evaluating in a participatory process if they're going to take on a client or not and they kind of put the same uh, scientific rigor into that mechanism that they put into the product um, and it's internally very transparent um, and it's very bespoke it, it fits their organization and the kind of clients that they're thinking about taking on and their values um, and so there are these kinds of ways in which this can be done um, i think we will see more work coming out on uh, accountability and what, what that means moving forward and i'm excited to see that but because that's a again a contextual Question and the question is also what are regulators are going to do with that? How are they going to demand that? And we've seen the, the new AI regulation proposed in April, where we've seen a sort of sector focus. So the market surveillance agencies will be trusted in enforcing some of these regulations. So it will come in in very concrete ways very soon. 
Yeah, very good points. I, th I think that the, the, this does raise a, a bigger question around that connection between ethics and regulation. But uh, Lance, are you willing uh, for, for final thoughts on this question around how we might measure or consider measuring ethical success? Wow. Um, yeah, I was thinking of like are they internal versus external signals or, or markers of, of progress, right? I, I think, you know, some of the panelists have kind of like, uh, you know, hit it on the head accurately, right? Like, I think internally, some of these things will be very hard to kind of capture because it is, it is like in some ways, like, you know, belief that in trust in like the kind of like systems, you know, and processes you're putting in place, right, to actually kind of adjudicate, raise concerns, and ultimately have them have impact in the ultimate kind of outcomes that, that an organization is making. But I think externally, I mean, I, I think someone mentioned this earlier about, uh, you know, sh you know the disseminating or kind of like talking about these issues publicly. I think maybe an external marker is that we have more conversations, both about the failures and successes. And there's a more robust kind of set of publicly available resources and tools that I think will lead to better practices. Because I think, so we've had this, this conversation somewhat orthogonally, um, but even the kind of field of kind of practitioners and, and individuals working in responsible innovation, it is somewhat difficult because much of the, the information and the tools are very in-house. Um, and so, I mean, ideally a kind of marker of progress is that we can have public discussion about these. We do have them in some respects in conferences like the Fairness, Accountability and Transparency Conference, where we begin to talk about some of these things in a research setting, but it'd be great to see more of this and, and, and feel there's a, there's a kind of shared sense that there's actually kind of a gold standard or set of practices that we've all kind of kind of had external vetting and believe that this is the kind of like that, a, a good set of approaches to take on. That's what to me at least would be kind of good markers of kind of like the kind of advancements and the kind of like, you know, actual serious turn of, of uh, kind of responsible innovation as a kind of uh, kind of field of practice. Really helpful, William. And, and finally, Shane, I want to turn to you as you, you'd originally brought out this concept. I'm very curious for your thoughts on how we might consider moving forward with how we measure ethical success. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, first of all, it's important to remember that not everything that counts can be counted and that we need to have a certain amount of humility uh, about the, the very need for metrics as a definition of success. Um, and as uh, Mona pointed out, the fact that in many organizations, we're just not good at looking at metrics uh, in a qualitative uh, uh, way. Um, and so, I, so one thing is just recognize the limitations of this, of this way of measuring success in the first place. Um, but of course, we, it, it, we still have to figure out how we're gonna do this. Um, and, 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 and even in a limited process, there are better ways to do it. Um, one of the ways is to think about the fact that we're not always reinventing the wheel. So often when people ask, well, how will we do this in ethics, uh, in AI? I think, has anyone ever had a similar problem in another industry? And the answer is almost always yes. Um, so how do we measure success in uh, food safety, um, right? Well, it's, it's hard to count the number of people you didn't poison. Um, certainly uh, there is a way to measure, you know, the, the number of incidents of contamination, um, but often it's just about measuring the quality and integrity of your processes internally, right? How good is your system? Um, and, and there are ways to measure those. And so when uh, when William was talking about how important it is to have good processes, we know how to evaluate uh, these processes. We've learned a lot in the last 10, 15 years about the kinds of processes specifically in tech and in AI that, uh, that lead to better ethical outcomes and decision-making. So make sure you have a process for evaluating your processes and how they're working. Um, and so uh, the final thing I'll say is that the other good signal, and Libby uh, acknowledged this, um, is your own people. Um, because one of the things, if you've ever worked in any organization, you know that one of the things people complain about a lot is when their sense that things are sort of ethically not right has been activated, right? Uh, and, and people may hide it uh, from their managers, um, but they, they discuss with one another when they're, when they're unhappy with what they're seeing and when, when they don't think integrity um, is really being protected within the organization and its processes. So um, it's really important that you have anonymous ways, safe ways for people to say how they think the organization is doing on these issues. Um, and so whether you have um, an ombudsman that can kind of take reports in a safe way that's trusted, um, whether you have surveys of employees that call out people to respond to how well they think the organization is doing on these issues. Those are usually going to be reliable signals 
um, people are less likely to uh, uh, to um, uh, be guilty of, of kind of, you know, grading their own homework in an unreliable way when you're asking them not how they're doing, but how the organization as a whole is doing on uh, on on the ethical side. Really good point. It's fantastic. I'm now going to hand it over to my colleague, Imre Bard. We've got a lot of questions from the audience and the Q&A function. We've got about 25 minutes left. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Imre to lead us through a few of those questions. Yes, thank you so much, Andrew, for facilitating such an amazing conversation. We have already covered so much ground, but we are also have a number of really exciting questions. Actually, the one that I would like to start with is kind of picking up, I think, on um, where you have left off. And it's a question about where ethics even starts. And I would like to combine two questions that we've seen in the Q&A. Um, one question points to um, this notion of where do we start ethics when, where do we start to think about ethics when, especially if we consider extractive and exploitative flows of materials and labor that often underlie the technologies um, that we have been discussing. Um, do you have any thoughts on, on how we can take those considerations into account? Do you see any promising existing frameworks? And combining that question with another one that came a bit earlier, um, do you see the possibility or the desirability of incorporating these kinds of considerations into things like ESG investments or B Corps or anything of, of that sort? And maybe we could start with Mona. The questions weren't addressed to anyone. Else, but if Mona, you'd like to start. Getting all of them, okay. <laughs> um, the tricky ones. So <clears throat> when it comes to the profoundly extractive nature of artificial intelligence systems, I think we are now generally, uh, again, at a point, and, and William spoke about this earlier, where we have these kinds of conversations generally about these issues and we know about them, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you do know as an employee in a tech company where your data comes from, what kind of a footprint it has in terms of the harms that it has caused with, you know, through a process of data collection and perhaps cleaning, um, what kinds of carbon footprints it has, um, just in the same way in which we don't necessarily know, we don't know where the ingredients for our food uh, come from when we go out, uh, eat our restaurant or we go shopping. So I think there's something uh, to be thought about in terms of where this material comes from in terms of supply chain uh, transparency that can be done and equally that can be in some ways taken up by these companies, right? Whereby it, it, it could become part of an ethics on a role as Jake uh, Metcalf and, and many Moss and Dana Boyd write about like what, you know, where does this, where does this stuff come from and how do we work with that? Um, and, and then kind of working it from there and building up uh, an infrastructure whereby it becomes common that we have this kind of transparency and where also, again, employees uh, and, and tech workers and also consumers have a literacy around that so they can make an informed um, decision. There is work going on around nutritional labels, for example, um, and you know that there's, there are interesting technical approaches to that that we're seeing. But again, as William said, like we need to see those move uh, out of the academic space and into practice. And, and it, it, you know, it's still, uh, the jury is still out on what will stick uh, in terms of these ideas. Um, and I'm gonna leave it at that and, and hope that the other panelists can add. Yes, is, is there anyone else who would like to jump in on that question? Libby, please. Thank you. I was just going to say, actually, in Ray, that it comes back to one of your opening points, which is what are, are we limited in the types of questions that we can ask when we talk about AI ethics? And I think we are. I think um, we have to be much more holistic in how we think about um, the overall impact of data-driven technologies. Um, certainly, again, little plug for the catapult, the, the framework there attempted to be holistic in its, in its view of the world and, and of business models. Um, should I jump into the question relating to kind of levers and potentially investors? Or do you want to ask someone uh, else? <laughs> no, I'm happy for you to do that. And I think William also wanted to come in uh, on this question afterwards. If, if William wants to cover, cover this first point, let's, let's do that. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I think uh, one of the things I maybe wanted to add in the beginning, if, you know, an expanded time, I do think is um, also the done of directionality of AI ethics questions um, are often very geared towards outputs 
and not inputs. Um, and I think we should, uh, I think largely this conversation is also kind of settling on this question of like, where does the line stop in terms of ethical considerations? And I think increasingly, obviously, the work of uh, Mary Gray and, and work around ghost work, I think uh, uh, Kate Crawford has written a recent book, um, The Atlas of AI, has explored these questions as well. Um, that, you know, obviously the, the, the line should not be when the system is being developed and there's predictions being made and then there's an outcome for communities or individuals, but then also the kind of upstream questions about um, how the data is being annotated, what labor conditions um, they're experiencing while doing this work, and ultimately are uh, the consent and the use of data, um, what is the scope of that? And so I do think this kind of where the line is is shifting and I think it's kind of important to kind of think about it from a life cycle perspective. Uh, and, and it's obviously um, going, you know, one of the challenges, of course, of even acknowledging that as part of the responsibility of a company to take on, this is actually going to be a new endeavor. As I think as Mona pointed out, right, many companies are not always fully aware of what their kind of footprint is in terms of their data collection. Um, they kind of take it as given and then um, worry about the kind of part that they're often very focused on, which is the, the kind of use and implementation. And so I do think that will be a healthy shift for the field to kind of have this kind of broader consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much, William. Libby, did you want to um, do the second part of your answer on the, on the investment front? Yes, I was going to say yes, there is a role, I think, for uh, not just um, not just impact investing, but uh, money, money is, whether we like it or not, a huge lever um, for change. Um, governments in, spend masses in procurement every year, and if they made supplier codes of conduct and conformity relating to AI ethics part of part of their procurement processes that would have positive change um, and the same thing for um, LPs our pension funds when they invest in um, other funds um, I think that would that I've started to see um, conversations around that happening all right I'm just going to pick another question we have amazing one so another one has to do actually we've had a number of questions relating to the kind of the bridging of um, linguistic and disciplinary and epistemological gaps and one question it says that much of the discussion has been shaped today from from kind of social science humanities shaped perspective but much of the design and implementation and scaling is done by members of the stem community so how do we actually create bridges between these and do you see or have you can you share some positive examples of how that happens in the organizations that, that we are familiar with. And maybe if Shannon is happy to answer this one, we can, we can start with her. Imre, um, I'm sorry, my audio for some reason is occasionally cutting out and uh, it has cut off part of your question. Can you- uh, Oh, can you sorry. It? Yes, no, yes, it's absolutely. My so a bunch of questions are about how to bridge uh, disciplinary and epistemological uh, gaps between people who are working in this space. And a lot of the discussion has been shaped uh, by the shape perspective today, uh, but a lot of the implementation is actually done by people with STEM backgrounds. So can you share any thoughts on, on how those gaps could be bridged in practice? Yeah, um, I mean, this is a major focus of, of my work uh, right now. Um, and, and I've spent a many, many years working on this problem from the education side. Uh, and, and actually, I think um, the, uh, post that Hannah uh, shared uh, earlier that, that, that I've uh, drafted uh, for the Institute um, in response to uh, John Tesulius' uh, provocation is, is on this very point. Um, we, there are short-term mitigations for this problem that you can implement in organizations where you, there are modes of training uh, where you can help bridge some of these gaps but ultimately this is a failure, um, I think, in our education systems and the way we've designed them um, to imagine that uh, technical and scientific expertise can in fact be cultivated uh, without uh, uh, humane expertise, uh, without historical uh, context and understanding, uh, without an understanding of uh, issues of justice and, uh, uh, and, and power in government. Um, we need to reclaim uh, some of the uh, ideals of a past era of liberal education before hyper specialization 
uh, took off. Now, I know that there are obstacles to that and they are real, they're not imagined. Um, the time that it takes to get a first class education in uh, uh, computer science, in, uh, in software engineering, right? Uh, where are you gonna fit in the extra learning that's needed? Um, and I think there has to be a way of fitting it in that doesn't involve, oh, we'll just take some philosophy courses on the side, right? There has to be a, a deeper integration of the way we develop uh, technical uh, and uh, moral and social expertise. It bothers me that a lot of people can go through a, a university course in philosophy or in history um, and really still come out learning very little about uh, how our built world uh, functions. Um, so it's, it's not just that technology needs the humanities uh, or that science needs the humanities. Um, it's also that uh, people studying the humanities uh, need to be more engaged with uh, understanding um, the nature of the built world, uh, the nature of, of scientific knowledge and, and how it's cultivated. So uh, we simply have to do some deep rethinking about our educational systems because the problems that humanity is facing in the 21st century and will face in the 22nd if we get there are not problems that will be solved by uh, groups of siloed specialists. It just simply will not happen. Uh, we need coordinated collective knowledge processes and the ability uh, to build systems of education that respond to the kinds of challenges we have today. And today's education system is not built for that purpose. Yes, William, please. Yeah. Shannon's response is so good. I, I, mean, I think definitely, like, I think that, like, thinking about the, the pipeline, I think that's absolutely right. I think uh, in the interim, dealing in an organization where you do have to live in a world with siloed expertise, I do think one of the ways we can think about kind of ethics and practice is um, surfacing and, and recognizing the importance of kind of translators is what I, I tend to call them, but like individuals who sit in between these silos and actually help do this kind of linguistic and epistemic bridging um, between kind of, you know, uh, engineers and kind of uh, individuals doing the kind of technical implementation and kind of, you know, uh, you know for taking a, 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 a Jake and Manny's uh, and, and um, of ethics owners, right? Uh, the kind of uh, individuals who are tasked with the responsibility of uh, drafting and, and kind of setting up um, kind of the uh, ethical processes within the organization. Um, these glue individuals, these translators are fundamental to kind of help actually build consensus and drive and what is sometimes not just necessarily substantive differences, but linguistic differences in how people are viewing their roles, their incentive structures, and actually what they're ultimately trying to strive for or working for when trying to kind of like jointly build a kind of uh, a technological artifact in a, an ethically responsible and sound way. Yes, thank you very much for both those answers. And I think Mona also wants to jump in on this one. Just very briefly, um, absolutely second, everything that Shannon has articulated so wonderfully and strongly and, and what William has just said, I would just add on to that, that that kind of, into, again, interdisciplinary work comes with um, facing a lot of tension, uh, especially the realization that there is no easy fix uh, as, a, as an engineer and as a social scientist, that there is, you don't actually necessarily know what's going on. Um, and that is uncomfortable. And I think we need to cultivate um, practices that allow us to sit with that tension. I tell that to my students kind of every day in the classroom when they get disappointed, when they say, well, but we can't fix it or we don't quite understand the whole thing. So that's kind of the nature of the work that needs to be done, especially against the backdrop of all the challenges that we're facing. We just had a massive global public health emergency. And the next one or the already ha one that's happening is the climate crisis and there will be more. So we have to get comfortable with uh, discomfort. I think that's something that, that is really important to cultivate. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much for that answer as well. Uh, and then maybe the final question uh, that we can take from the Q&A before we uh, close this round and hand over to Alison comes from, anonymous, from an anonymous person who is, who is asking for examples uh, around principal critiques of the ideology driving AI and the ways in which that often reproduces scientific racism and environmental racism. Um, and this kind of relates back to the point that uh, William raised at the beginning that we need to move towards a multipolar, multi-perspective, uh, multi-party um, 
consideration of these issues. But I think the question is trying to get at whether you have seen examples where kind of a, a change in the status quo has somehow been achieved or an attempt has been made to, to, act, to actually create a change. Um, and if anyone would like to take that question. Uh, well, I guess I'll take a stab at it. Uh, I mean, I think I think there has been lots of writing on it, but I mean, I would look at the kind of sea change in public sentiment around facial recognition as an example of where I think the fundamental ideology around like that technology has been kind of surfaced and like I think the public has pushed back on it very rightly. I think, I mean, it emerged from obviously the work by Timmy Gebru and, and Joy Bolawimi and Deb Raji, right? But I think like obviously this has been a much, a much larger concerted effort from civil society you know, championing the kind of role of human rights and, and, and pushing back against the kind of expansive uses of, of their technology. Now, obviously that is like, not that it's a success, but obviously like that's obviously not capturing the broader kind of like kind of scope and use of these technologies. But I think it's a good example of where we're starting to see like evidence where kind of like well honed pushback against technologies can lead to not just a change in use, but a change in kind of public acceptance of a particular form of technology. We're also seeing this now, I think, increasingly with emotional recognition, right? Where I think people are seeing, I think, similar both critiques and kind of shift in public sentiment towards this kind of being an acceptable technology and in, in common practice. So, yeah, I mean, I think like there, I mean, it's it's slow going, but I do think there are examples of this. And not to mention, I think, you know, I, I, maybe this wasn't the kind of direction of travel for the question, but obviously there's lots of writing and thinking around these questions. I would say AI ethics as a field of study is maybe more recent in trying to take on these questions, but there's certainly a kind of robust body of literature that is trying to directly interrogate this question more deeply and try to make those links to the, the kind of real world. Yes. Is, is there anyone else who would like to add some points to this question? If, if not, then I think I would just like to thank you all for this amazing, for this amazing uh, discussion and for sharing all these extremely important points and perspectives. I also want to thank Andrew for facilitating the conversation. And I just have to say how deeply humbled and, and excited uh, I was to spend this um, 70, 18 minutes in, in your company. And I will now hand the word to Alison, our director, who is going to make an exciting announcement and, and close up our series of events. So thank you very much. Thank you everyone on the panel. And I would also really like to uh, thank all of the attendees um, and participants of this entire week of events, um, which have been exploring the Just AI projects and um, interests and, experiments in interrogating some of the issues that we've talked about uh, in this panel, but also across the week, questions about uh, what and how AI ethics is practiced, by whom, in which ways, what are the justice implications, who is inside and outside of the uh, discussions on AI ethics. And I just want to take a minute to um, announce that we've finally got our um, ethical prototype working. Um, I talked about this on Monday. Uh, this is a tool for reflection uh, to think about how we participate in these discussions around data and AI ethics. Um, and so this kind of prototype is doing the sort of translation and reflection work uh, that the panelists today have been talking about. It's also uh, intended to provide a kind of entree into the sorts of discussions that I think we need to have in future that actually might produce these sorts of frictions that were also mentioned today. Um, and so as a, as a kind of visual prototype, uh, what this tool does is um, invites you to sort of answer a few questions that will take about 20 minutes. And at the end of that, um, it will ask you to wait for a few minutes to generate uh, one of these beautiful branching images like the one that you see in the black box on my screen um, that show a little bit uh, some of the qualities of your particular entry into and engagement with the questions that we've been talking about all week. Um, the prototype also shows how you relate, how your answers relate to other people's answers um, who have also filled out this reflective survey. 
Um, and what it generates fundamentally um, are responses to questions like, who has influenced you? Uh, what authors do you think are significant? And most importantly, for those of us who do research, what would you do with a no strings attached grant of 125,000 um, pounds? Which I think is a question nobody ever asks. You know, what would you do if there were no resource constraints in, in terms of the ways that you would like to approach um, and engage in work and conversation on these issues? Uh, you'll also see that we've set up a Discord server, and in time, we are going to try to connect people um, based on their interests um, as expressed through the survey um, into that Discord server. And we are, over time, also going to have many, many more challenging, interesting, um, friction and friction, frictioning and inspiring kinds of conversations, such as the one that we've had today. So um, I do invite all of you to follow the link, which I think Emory is also going to post into the chat. Um, please feel free to screenshot your uh, fingerprint and put it on Twitter. Uh, tag us and we can start seeing um, one another's and our own pathways into and around data and AI ethics as we close out this extraordinary series of events. I must say I am um, I'm a little bit tired, but I'm also incredibly inspired, uh, challenged and really motivated to take forward all of these conversations. Um, so I'm going to close my remarks um, with great thanks to the Just AI team, um, which includes Emery Bard, who has been chairing this panel, uh, Louise Hickman, who has been working on some of the other panels, uh, Octavia Reeve uh, at the Ada Lovelace Institute, and Hannah Kitcher, who has made the entire thing work properly, extremely courageously, elegantly, and largely in the background. So thank you so much to everyone on the team, um, to everyone who's collaborated, and to everyone who has attended our events. Um, please stay in touch and enjoy the prototype. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Allison. We really appreciate it. I want to thank all of our panelists once again so much for joining us today, and I want to thank everyone who attended um, have a lovely rest of the day. We'll speak again soon. Take care, everyone.